Welcome to Part the System. And today I'm with Katie McClure, founder of Uncommon Health Solutions, with a purpose of making it easier for people to be healthy. Now, it's a very special episode because we're coming from the USA today um, where Katie is based. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to speak to Katie. Um, now, Katie spent her career working in and around healthcare for about 25 years, and um, but has spent the last several years listening to the Indigenous, BIPOC, which is the Black and Indigenous and People of Colour, and Latin X, which is gender inclusive for Latino and Latina. Also, the LGBTQ plus community, youth experiencing foster care and having aged out people experiencing houselessness, people living with addiction and in, in recovery and rural voices. Now, Katie's worked alongside a lot of communities. She supported urban, rural and tribal communities and organizations in learning about trauma and resilience. And then through policy and practice, creating conditions that nurture resilience. Ultimately offsetting and in some cases ending cycles of trauma. With its roots in privilege, Katie's learned to navigate what she now re recognizes as patriarchal and oppressive corporate landscapes. That's quite something, Katie. Uh, with an international MBA, she's learned about the importance of culture. And with the background of process improvement, Casey's learned to peel the onion and look for the root causes, which she jokingly says, ruined me forever. <laughs> how, are, how are you, Katie? I'm doing well. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you so much for joining me and from the USA. So where, whereabouts are you coming from in America? Pretty close to the middle. We're in Colorado. We live at 7,000 feet, so a little bit up in the mountains. Right. Yeah, and it looks like you've got a, a bit of a tan there, so pretty high up, are you? Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to avoid the sun, even on a cloudy day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I love in the backdrop there, it looks like you're in some sort of cabin. Yeah, it is. We have a little one room uh, structure on our land out here. Um, it's really fun. My husband and I share it as an office space. It's been helpful during the pandemic, for sure. Yeah, I bet. Sounds wonderful. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining me. And yeah, we'll get straight into it. And um, yeah, what does well-being mean to you, Katie? Oh, it means lots of things. And it, I think it means something different to each person. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, we can break it down into a wheel of, you know, the social aspect, the physical aspect, the nutritional aspect. Um, I have kind of done a deep dive, you know, you mentioned peeling the onion. And mm. so I spend a lot of time looking at, uh, trauma and then how that, um, makes all the other components of well-being harder. Um, so for me personally, though, that's my kind of my workspace for me personally, um, I, right now I spend a lot of time thinking about just balance, um, and being aware of the trauma that's happening, coming at me, um, and that I need to, you know, I need to every morning. So I have, I should say I have two little kids, eight mm -hmm. and five years old. Yeah. And they'll keep you busy. They <laughs> they are keeping me busy, especially during the <laughs> pandemic. They are home all the time. Um, it looks like they'll be home again. Um, and then I'm trying to work. And so there's a lot happening. And I know a lot of others are in that situation. So every morning before anybody gets up, I sit outside. I watch the sunrise. I watch the birds. We get swarms of birds um, that fly over our property. You can hear it and feel it when they come by and it's just the most amazing way to start your day. So well-being for me means taking at least five minutes <laughs> out of my day to just pause and kind of pay attention to my senses so that I can handle whatever the day throws at me. <laughs> yeah, lovely. So that real grounding in the morning where, you know, you're just listening to the and you're one, I suppose, with the environment around you. And I suppose it's so beautiful where you are in yeah. in the mountains that taking that in is uh, probably somewhat special yeah yeah and what are the other things that you do to look after your well-being um so we we live on a farm um it's a, a farm that needs a lot of work we're new to it so we were oh, outside you're new. 
How long have you been there? A year and a half. A okay. year and a half. So we moved here from Oregon a year and a half ago. Um, and so we have four acres and we have, it was overgrazed. So it needs a lot of, the soil needs a lot of healing. And um, we might actually talk about that because I noticed soil health is a lot, is very similar to human health. Um, and so I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that, but um, it also keeps my, me moving. Um, mm. So we have ducks and geese and so we have to feed them and we have to move the hay and we have to move the fence and the wheelbarrow and um, <laughs> so we, we spend a lot of time moving um, we try to connect um, with family but one of the fun fun things we do in our house is uh, trying to be real attentive to stress and try to catch it before it takes over us mm. and so with the kids that has turned into wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> so we will spend, you know, five minutes. If we feel the tensions getting high, we'll say, let's go have a wrestle. And as much as I really dislike wrestling, um, it always ends in laughter and it releases all of the the stress and allows us to kind of regroup. So yeah, that's, I like that's that one way. Yeah, it's like that cathartic way of getting your energy out, I suppose, and having a bit of a rumble and then, yeah, um, <laughs> getting getting on with it. So so I'd love to hear more about your story, Katie. Obviously, we've spoken before and you've got a, um, a lot of experience working with trauma, um, which I think is super interesting. But yeah, if you could just give us, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, I think I'll focus. I spent a good part of my early career in healthcare um, and had a really cool job um, where my my responsibility was to figure out how do we keep our um, keep people healthy mm -hmm. so that we can um, provide less care ultimately so that we can charge less yeah so it's it was kind of a, an a really good job within a really kind of crummy <laughs> healthcare system in the U.S. So the incentives were right in that um, job. And while I was in healthcare, I stumbled upon the Adverse Childhood Experiences study out of Kaiser Permanente, um, which was done years and years ago. And I was working for Kaiser Permanente at the time. And that study blew my mind because I was steeped in all of the costs I knew what every single piece of healthcare cost <laughs> every time we did it. <laughs> um, that was my job to know those things and and figure out how to do fewer of them because people were healthy. And this study showed that the more adverse childhood experiences somebody has, uh, the more likely they are to have all sorts of chronic conditions mm. in, as an adult. And so when I say adverse childhood experiences, I'm talking about things like physical, emotional and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect and kind of household challenges like having mental health challenges in the home, um, drug and alcohol use in the home, incarceration. Those that specific bucket was studied. Now, there's a lot of other trauma that we may talk about, but that was studied. And the exponential increases attached to chronic conditions blew my mind because we were excited when we could reduce the chance of something by, you know, tiny percentage points. Um, and so that changed the whole course of my career. Um, ultimately, mm -hmm. I left healthcare. I decided I was going to go work further upstream and um, ended up fast forward through a couple of kind of I don't know, jumping points, um, ended up working in a really cool um, effort up in Oregon that was the what you that is in that bio quite a bit, where I was working with indigenous communities and black and brown and Latinx and LGBTQ and all these different communities who've experienced and rural, like deep rural communities experiencing all these different kinds of traumas um and just listening to their experiences and they were nothing like much of my experience so also in my bio it talked about i kind of i learned how to navigate this system that we have in america at least 
And I, I knew how to talk the talk. I knew how to walk the walk. I knew what my bosses wanted me to do. Um, and so I w- moved up the ladder in, in corporate healthcare. But then I listened to all these stories. And it's like, oh, man, <laughs> while the system is benefiting me over and over, it is failing a lot of people. Um, and just seeing all of the impacts just changed changed everything for me. Um, and so now I'm pretty committed to um, trying to help anyone I can <laughs> see the shortcomings of our systems, um, specifically through the lens of trauma science. That must have been quite a poignant moment in your career then to have a paradigm shift like that when you've been working in the system and then all and then to realize that it's not working and uh you know it's um yeah how how did you cope with that because i suppose if you've been studying and you've been working in in one you know going in one direction and then yeah you 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 realize it it's it's a bit different yeah how, how did that go yeah, it was it was hard. Um, I I can remember the day. I remember the moment when somebody uh, I was I already knew this, and so I was trying to get at it um, using the tools I had. Um, and then I realized I was a white woman trying to help, mm-hmm. and so I still had this mindset that I was, you know, better than, and so. The things that I had achieved were solely because of what I put into it, as opposed to also being because the systems generally benefit me um, and because I haven't had as much trauma as many people have. Um, And so I remember the moment when somebody looked me in the eye and said, um, we don't need yet another white woman trying to help. Mm. What she was saying was, we need you to, like, fix the systems. (laughs) You, Katie, don't need to help me. Um, we all need to be fixing these systems that aren't working for probably most of us. Um, and that I think the journey I've been on is realizing that the systems actually don't work for me. Mm. While it, it helped me get a job and get paid well, um, I also lost a lot of myself because I knew how to adapt. Um And we could talk about my experience as a woman and as a little girl and as a teenager and things that I didn't recognize until, you know, this past few years as traumas that happened to me and that lived in my body um, and probably and still live in my body um, uh, physiologically. So it's it's been a big shift in in a lot of ways. But. um, First, I had to recognize that I didn't need to make that big salary. Yeah. So I honestly, like, I saved a bunch of money and said, I'm going to do the work I want to do, and it's not going to pay me as well. Um, and then I had to get a lot of training because I had to unlearn a lot. Um, and then I had I was gifted with this job I mentioned um, where I was paid enough to sit in rooms and listen to people's stories of of real trauma and real marginalization mm. and and how the system wasn't working for them and so just doing a lot of listening, I changed my whole social media feed. Um, so where it had kind of self curated, I mm-hmm. now went out and said I'm going to go listen to new voices, mm. um, voices that are not you know just naturally coming at me through the the, the system design, and that's mm. helped a lot too. Just to yeah be able to hear different stories. I think just putting your bias and the way you see things to the side and just listening. It's uh, I don't think we do it enough. And from reading some of your articles around, you know, you going into these communities and you just listening and taking on the feedback and shutting your eyes and, you know, just building up that trust <clears throat> is, is just, I suppose, been really um, a real great journey for you to, to be on. Um, but back to trauma, because it's such a fascinating topic and I think is getting more and more um, airtime now and you know I'm, I'm reading the book The Body Keeps the Star- Score at nice. the moment and uh, you know so you, when you talk about physiological you know effects of trauma and things and um, 
do you think what how do you see it in terms of you know because everybody I suppose has had a little bit of trauma in their life you know mm-hmm. we've all we've all had we've all um got our own stories and journeys um how could you unpack it a little bit more about how that affects chronic chronic disease yeah there's a a great and usually I answer this by pressing the video button for a TED talk by uh, <laughs> what, what is Dr. it? It's uh, so Dr. Nadine Burke Harris mm-hmm. um, is a pediatrician in California. She's now actually the I think her title is um, Surgeon General for the state of California. Mm. Um, but she does a great TED talk on the the changes that happen in your body and brain. But the easiest way to describe it is we are um, actually, maybe I'll use this. So there's a hand model of the brain. So if you pretend this, my hand is my brain and my thumb tucked in, so I'm making a fist. Um, my thumb is tucked in. That is representing your amygdala, which mm-hmm. is your fear response. So the fight, flight, and right. freeze response. The fingers wrapped over the thumb are your prefrontal cortex. Mm-hmm. This is where your reasoning happens. And so there's a reason you have a fear response, right? If there's a bear coming at you in the woods, you need to either hide and freeze or run and flee that flight. Um, But she will say the challenge comes when that bear comes home every night. So you're in a situation where it is constant toxic stress, not the good kind of stress that helps us grow, but the toxic stress that overwhelms our system. So this amygdala part of your brain gets really strong. It gets, it's doing its job. It gets really strong. But when your amygdala gets really strong, your prefrontal cortex can't do its job. And so, Mm. you know, we have this nice representation where you literally take your fingers and flip them up. And so you flip your lid. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because this is doing its job, your prefrontal cortex where your reasoning happens can't do its job. She will go on to tell you about all the things happening throughout the rest of your body which just, Mm. you know, Mm. um, escalate that response. And then the other piece is that it's actually hardwiring itself. Yeah. And so now, you know, if you're a kid in a class and your fear response is so strong and something little happens, you're going to blow up, right? You're going to throw that chair because Mm -hmm. that's what you're trained to do. Um, Yeah. So... Thank you for that. And um, I think, you know, it's around neuroplasticity and, mm-hmm. you know, once if it's if it's repeated, like you said, then I suppose it becomes patterns and and that can be stored, Katie, can't it, in, in different parts of your body. Right. Mm-hmm. So some people maybe in their chest or, you know, it might be it, it can it can end up in different parts for, 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 for you know, different people. But so. So maybe it's we're all trying to manage, you know, what what trauma we we've had really, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, I suppose it's uh, it's sometimes not being judgmental when people are the way they are sometimes because there might be something. You talk about peeling back that onion, um, there might be some some reasoning in there um, as to why they're showing up in the world like that. Yeah, I think that's the biggest gift I've taken from this is I now have compassion when I see mis people people misbehaving around me or towards me. Mm. Um, I can depersonalize it a lot more easily and say, oh, Mm. they've got something going on. Mm. It's still not okay to act that way. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) It is not an excuse for, you know, violence or behaviors like that, but I can understand it more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that leads me to my next question then. In terms of uncommon health solutions and, uh, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that and, yeah, why why you founded it. Um, well, I founded it because my healthcare job taught me that it's that's way too far down the line. Um, like we are just we are pouring money, pouring money into a system that is way too far down the line. And if we can move upstream and just create a world where it's yeah. easy for us to be healthy, both in terms of movement and 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 food, but also in terms of like stress and compassion and trauma and healing. Um, you know, that ranges from I've worked on projects related to street design and, mm. you know, trying to end child abuse. So it's um, a big passion of mine. Yeah, awesome. And 
What about the the healthcare system? Just can you give us a little bit of overview for context, what it's like in America? It's probably a big question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get tired of talking about the healthcare system because everybody talks about in in the U.S. We talk about health reform, we yeah. talk about healthcare, we talk about innovation and technology, and all of these things are over. It, this is my opinion because, and I've yes. worked in the system, so it's a pretty informed opinion. Um, we overcomplicate it completely. We have so much administrative cost and so many requirements. If you try to get insurance in the U.S., yeah, I mean, people with advanced degrees can't read these matrices that outline what coverage you're going to get for what cost and all these different com- types of costs that you have or don't have. And and then there's these gaps where people don't have any coverage. Um, and you've got people going getting health care bankruptcy, um, complete bankruptcy. And some people have just no coverage. I have this great example. I love this example. Some in my family don't like it as much, but my father uh, recently battled cancer here and his employer had some amazing health coverage and Mm. he was able to qualify for a test and Mm. we thought he was at end of life and now he is back, completely back in action, golfing, happy, um, really annoyed that he retired um, during all that. So he had amazing coverage and care. My Mm. son swallowed um, a coin on a trip mm-hmm. we were on and it it plugged his throat and we weren't sure if it was in his airway or you know his his throat and so we called the ambulance cuz he couldn't uh, and so he went to the hospital 15 minute ambulance ride and you know two x-rays and we paid more for that than my father paid for an entire cancer treatment and and like test experimental test that's um, crazy and people have much, much, much more horrifying stories than that. So yeah, so there's a it's wide not a good dis- system. <laughs> no, a wide disparity. Then it's not. It doesn't seem fair um, and yeah. unequal. No. Um, so so really, again, it's probably you know the people that are more rich and wealthy can look after themselves, but people from maybe lower socioeconomic areas and deprived communities, it's, yeah, struggling. Because I think it's around 3.8 trillion you spend on the on the, on the healthcare. It's, it's, quite, it's atrocious. Quite a lot. It's quite a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's not okay. And, and, I mean, chronic diseases is, is pretty significant in Australia, Katie. We have about one in two um, that have a chronic disease. Uh, in America, I think it's six in 10 have a lifestyle chronic disease and four in 10 adults have two or more. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, one of the leading causes of death and disability, as you, as you well know. So you've worked in the system, you're working outside the system now. Obviously, you're doing a lot with trauma. But if you could nudge the system in one way to improve the well-being uh, of, of Americans, what could that look like? I would like every institution, every agency, every organization, every government entity to become trauma informed. Trauma informed. They have to understand trauma, the science of it. They have to understand what it is doing to our bodies and then what that is doing to our communities because it, it's impacting healthcare, like we're talking about, but it's also impacting education. If you've got unhealed trauma, you can't learn. You're showing up to school and you're not ready to learn. You can't work 100% fully, um, you know, engaged. Um, So I just, we've got a lot of, a lot of things are messed up and could be exponentially improved if we just understood trauma more broadly. So is that, is that actually happening? Is there, I mean, in terms of that education, I think it's Mate Gabo, isn't it? The, uh, uh, Gabor Mate, he, yeah. That's right. That's right. He's um, quite an inspirational guy ar- around this and uh, just brought a, a video up, a, a film out, which I watched recently. Um, but how do you get this uh, this education in mainstream then so we can start to, to tackle chronic disease through this trauma lens? Yeah, well, thankfully, there is a movement happening um, in the U.S. And, and around the world. I know we were just talking there's the Center for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice in the U.S., and we were just 
um, brought in some folks from England who are doing this. So I know it's happening elsewhere around the world. Um, but that is a group of people from throughout the country doing grassroots work um, in local tiny communities, but also we have full states who are going through a trauma-informed um, 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 transformation where the mm. all of the government agencies in the state are doing that. We've got a start of a bipartisan, uh, which is huge, uh, effort of the governors to to organize around this, um, and then some some activity happening at the federal level as well. So it's 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 happening, and I expect it'll it'll spread more rapidly in the years to come. Yeah. Fantastic. And and how how would you measure that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, they have. So there's two schools of thought. The adverse childhood experiences study is an actual survey. So mm. they in pediatric often in children's doctors offices, they'll take a survey and they'll say, do you have these things in your home? Generally, they don't ask you to share the specifics. They just want the number at the end because mm -hmm. they know that if you have two or more or three or more or four or more, your risk factors go up. There's a lot of people, myself included, who think that can generally be re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. And so there are a number of um, other surveys. My favorite is one called the well-being survey or the well-being assessment that incorporates a lot of the more traditional measures of health and well-being in both individual and in community, but it also includes um, the, the community uh, resilience factors that mm. will offset the traumas. So you don't have to know the traumas to know whether or not somebody has enough to offset what's happening. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Because I suppose it would have to be longitudinal, wouldn't it, in terms of right. being able to measure that over time. Right. Um, and because I suppose trauma for some is it's got a bit of stigma, hasn't it? In turn, you know, for, for to, to bring you have to be very sure vulnerability and be open to talk about your trauma, if it, particularly if, if it's, you know, really confronting and, um, you know, there's different levels of it. So do you deliver workshops around trauma in communities? And yeah, how how, how does that go? Yeah, I do. I do what's more of an intro level. Um, I've worked with a lot of people who do the in-depth. Um, there's some amazing trainers out there who do these workshops. I do a high level yeah. workshop that just has the introductory information, kind of what I shared in a little bit more detail. But also I talk a lot about the impact in communities in different mm -hmm. sectors. And so one of the things I'm designing right now is uh, sort of a multi-day experience where people who want to learn about these things and dig into them and see the connections across sectors mm. um, and then figure out what to do at the policy level, um, mm. both organizational and in the U.S. at the state level and at the federal level. Um, mm. I'm hoping to create some conversations that trickle out um, more broadly and kind of have, you know, healthcare talking to agriculture and farming leaders talking to you, education leaders and economic and political leaders. Mm. So really, really, really um, trying to connect that system, aren't you? Um, so everybody's working together with that common purpose. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And I always find sport and, you know, whether it's health or well, well-being and, you know, it's, um, it's a very good healer for trauma. Mm hmm you know, with that connection and. Absolutely. We talk about trauma, but we talk about resilience, which is those things that offset it. And we look at the things that are individual inside us kind of mm. our own grit and what we bring, mm -hmm. but also the people and the places around us. And so oftentimes a coach or a team or an activity can save a life that is mm -hmm. absolutely offsetting the trauma. It's also mm. keeping you moving. Um, it's creating relationships and all those things help heal trauma. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. And where do you see yourself personally in the system now? And how do you contribute and influence it? The system, uh, probably as a disruptor. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm really not interested in business as usual 
in any yeah. of those sectors that I described. And there's so many cool people and the youth today are doing these amazing things to really, excuse me, really create conditions where we can all thrive. And so I think I want to kind of join hands with the youth and try to create space where the changes that they bring um, can happen faster um, because they get it. More, more youth are getting this than ever when I was younger. Definitely more than most of the adult circles I live in. Yeah, well, maybe things are more easy to talk about these days, which which helps. I would imagine there's a contributing factors, but yeah, um, I think around even like mental health and trauma, you know, we we are starting to to talk about it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Bit more, a bit more accepted, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. So that that. That brings us just about to the end, Katie. So that that's flown by. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to to mention? There's one thing that popped into my head that I think is important to share around this. The topic of trauma, I think, and this shocked me in my mm. um, work. It can be very unifying if approached well. So in the U.S., we have these really, really intense, uh, an intense divide politically. We have the Mm. right and the left, and we Mm. are just divided. Um, The reality is people on the right and people on the left have all experienced some kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about trauma, if we can first, no matter who we're talking with, I think we need to see see each other see each other in their in our own in the their experience um acknowledge that that experience is true and real and there was hurt and there was magic um and that these are humans (laughs) Mm. um and that trauma has disrupted all of our bodies and some Mm. of us have had more healing than others and some Mm. of us have had um So I think if we look at the misbehaviors as trauma showing up in community, then we can also have more compassion um, and start to maybe talk about our disagreements using a different language that might be more unifying. I think that's beautiful. And it... What comes up for me there is everyone's got a story and I think we mentioned it before, a background, you know, they've, they've been navigating their, their, their selves through life and you look at homelessness or, you know, people who've got drug abuse, you know, it's, uh, it's usually, that's, that's, that's usually the result of, of some trauma or, you know, some circumstance that, that that's happened. So it's how we can collectively work together, isn't it? To try and tackle some of these systemic issues of our time. Uh, yeah. but, I, but I think, you know, what you're doing in terms of advocating and educating around the importance of understanding trauma, I think is amazing. So um, it's been awesome to speak to you, Katie. And uh, I've learned so much uh, from our from our conversations that we've, that we've had so far. And uh, yeah. Just wishing you all the best for the rest of the year uh, in Colorado. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. So I will, you, um, yeah, you're very welcome. And um, is, there, is, that, is that it? You got anything else? No, that, that is it. I think the closing line is that it's not um, what's wrong with us. It's what's happened to us. Well put. Beautiful. Okay. Well, hopefully one day I'll I'll see you over in the USA. <laughs> Likewise. It'd be great to come to Australia. Thanks for yeah. the connection. Okay. Speak to you soon, Katie. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye.